they're just like they're just wearing trainers and jeans and hats and t-shirts and anoraks and there's no image okay what do you want us to be like then uh, well some hair some winkle pickers some tight kecks some makeup right okay like everyone else right all right The Mondays lacked factory's trademark angst and pretension, but Pickering suggested that the label should sign them anyway. Wilson agreed. He now had a genuinely street-smart, unruly gang with guitars to help realise his vision. In the North, we'd play like working men's clubs, but not in a working men's clubs night. It'd be like the son who'd gone to university. You know, I'm putting a night on tonight, you know, and just be simply because we were on factory, we got the gig. And normally, as soon as they seen us, they would have dismissed us, but one because on factory, they're like, well, we'll see. You know, there must be something about him because Tony's, you know, signed him. It was so non typical factory, you know, it wasn't what, what, what it, it was assumed factory did, and it was finally a sudden burst of, of non factory life, you know, that, that, that seemed to fit with the times and then gave the Hacienda its own sense that factory did know what they were doing. Because, of course, the Hacienda wouldn't have made as much sense if they hadn't had the Happy Mondays, you know, it, it kind of worked together, the two things worked together. Wilson championed Happy Mondays as the people's band, with the help of a promotions budget unprecedented at factory. Now managed by one of his close friends, Nathan McGough, the band was beginning to enjoy both critical and financial success. They were every band in Manchester's favourite band. That's what they had. They had something that all the bands knew, like, wish we could be like them. I wish we could be like them. And, you know, the songs didn't have, like, obvious songs or catchy stuff, but they just had this gang mentality and Sean doing his do and it just connected with people. No one gives them the proper credit, but the fact that they're the ones who took the new black rhythms out of America and adapted them to to modern music, to modern British music. You know, at the time, personally, I didn't even want to, want, I didn't want to play gigs. I was really happy just with me and my friends jamming in a room. I didn't want to make a record, I really didn't. But obviously one has to evolve. If one's going to make something of something, one has to do these sort of things. He's a spokesman of his generation and he'll hate anybody for saying that, you know, because because it's managed to people don't like that kind of crap up here, you know, it's less people want to debunk the myth all the time. It's like, you know, but 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 the lyrics he was singing directly communicate with that audience. I I had a, a little wish list and like to do do a demo tick that off. Next one was to get a record deal, tick that off, you know, and down the list was do top of the pops. Thanks very much, Jackie. Now the band has come all the way from Manchester. They're called Happy Monday, featuring a very special guest, Kirsty McCall. The song's Alla Julia, and it's number 30. Another Manchester band also appeared on the show for the first time that night. A band Factory failed to sign. A band that was going to be big. Stone Roses, managed from a very early day by the ex-manager of Hacienda, who I thought I'm sorry about this, Ginger, as you know, I think you're an idiot. Secondly, managed by my first wife. Thirdly, managed by my ex-partner, Martin Hannett, and somebody else. So everybody involved with this group, the Stone Fucking Roses, was my ex-partner. So I wanted nothing to do with the Roses. 
we now remember the stone roses, quite rightly, for things like Fool's Gold, which is the, the rolling acid house rhythm that the Mondays invented six months before. I mean, I think Factory is fantastic because out of it, by not signing Buscox and Magazine, The Fall, The Smith, Stone Roses, not signing those five bands and still being the label it is, that, that to me is, the, is, is almost the essence of the story. Happy Mondays come from Little Alton. I had a single out this past week, they have an album out in a fortnight. I work with them, but this isn't nepotism, it is a profound devotion to the cause. 1988, the second summer of love. The Happy Mondays and the Stone Roses rule the world, and Manchester has become Madchester. At the Hacienda, business is booming, courtesy of Acid House and Ecstasy, the clubber's disco biscuit. It had its own little fanzine going on in the queue, people running up and down the queue, I've got the besties, no, I've got the besties, like fucking market stalls set up, that was all that was missing, was someone setting a market stall up outside the queue. There was a whole scene going on in the queue. You go to club, take this pill, and you'd have like six hours of like amazing fun, and that's, that's why, uh, that's why that worked, and it was, it was the best known space for it, everyone just poured in. What do you think about the drug ecstasy? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and suddenly it had this crap atmosphere, so where else have been a year before, it'd been this really freezing cold place of water dripping from the roof. Suddenly it's like the hottest place you've ever been in, absolutely packed. People just dancing on the walls, swinging from the roof. You see the pictures of it now, it's insane, you can't even work out what the floor is, and that's what it's like at the time. All these faces, off their heads, dancing. But some of them might have just been high off the music of a small percentage, but there could have been. Um, but it was just like nothing else most people had seen. Manchester's always been a party city. It's been a party city for centuries. It's been famous for people having it large at the weekends and, and wanting to have a good time. It felt like it was the most popular place in the world. We had a, a bit by the, by the far corner of the bar where we'd stand. And to get there, you just have to walk through this sea of people having the time of their lives. Whatever it costs, it gives a fuck, it was great. People looked up to the DJ like a god and begging them at the end to really please play one more tune. I mean, please, I shouted many a night, please, let's play one more, one more, and get the crowd saying one more. The fact that suddenly this youth culture exploded on our dance floor was a real privilege. Of course, as soon as it exploded and we made some money, then we'd have a meeting to say, at last we're making money, after many, many years of throwing money into it. And suddenly go, oh, if we're making money, I'll tell you what, it's not going to last long, is it? What was now the most famous club in the world also claimed Britain's first dance floor death from ecstasy in 1989.